And I, I'm so excited to be here and, and share some of the um, research findings and information I've been gathering um, on the community of thoroughfare. Um, some of you may be familiar uh, with a recent um, effort uh, sponsored by the county or through the county to do a documentation project for this great community here on the north uh, uh, west corner in the northwest corner of Prince William. Um, this documentation project um, was was um, overarching in, in, in a good way to help set um, a, a nice foundation for um, being able to um, nominate uh, the thoroughfare historic district as a um, uh, to the National Register of Historic Places, which I'm sure everyone in this room knows more about uh, or knows about. But um, but anyway, this project included an architectural survey, um, a, a number of oral histories uh, with um, with more actually uh, about a dozen uh, with descendants and individuals that had long term associations uh, with the thoroughfare community, an archaeological assessment uh, that looked at the potential for exploring archaeological resources in the area. Um, and as I just mentioned, the preliminary information form for the Thoroughfare Historic District, which was approved by um, the DHR in 2022. Um, but since, uh, since we're all here and, and patting ourselves on the back and, and, and excited to learn more, um, I want to take a moment um, just to sincerely thank um, what I'll call the creators and the investors, um, the countless area volunteers the people, the public servants, and the organizations that dedicate their time to preserve local history um, and make it available to others. Uh, this would include, of course, the dozen oral history candidates who were patient with me as I compiled data on their loved ones, <laughs> misspelled names, mistyped dates, and glossed over their lifetime's worth of accomplishments in a few sentences. <laughs> but, uh, but these people uh, certainly contributed and help, are helping to build um, a, a better awareness and a foundation for all of us. Uh, to learn more from, and I will just briefly mention um, that the oral history candidates that, included, that participated in this project, Donald Christian, Gina Allen Thomas, and her daughter Danielle, Judy Thomas, Harvey Jones, Victoria Price, the Reverend Delaney Washington and his mother Isabel Washington, and members of the Fields family, including the recently departed Willie Fields and his nieces and nephews, Greg, Patricia, and Debbie Fields. Uh, Anyway, the, oh, and then also the facilitators, sorry, they were the creators, investors, but the facilitators and the distributors, all the people who make these resources more accessible, the exciting outburst uh, of online databases, um, the scanning of public you know, records and documents, all these ways that technology really is helping us um, understand uh, um, and, and bring together more history and make it available. So I will start this talk um, just by talking why uh, a thoroughfare is historically significant um, as the, after the data collected during the architectural survey, which was um, recorded 33 uh, resources across 130 acres that were in this district, um, and the archaeological, infor archaeological assessment information in oral history uh, studies, they informed the PIF, and we uh, came to the conclusion that the Thoroughfare Historic District highlights a distinctly vernacular rural village that took root along an important transportation corridor in northwestern Prince William County in the decades after the Civil War, when freeborn and formerly enslaved African Americans and other people of mixed ancestry, including Native Americans, purchased small farms and lots around this railroad station at Thoroughfare. Uh, situated along an early 19th century turnpike and a mid 19th century railroad corridor that was heavily trafficked during the Civil War, the community of Thoroughfare emerged during a notable time in rebuilding uh, in the literal sense, the physical reconstruction, but also at a time of economic and social rebuilding here in Prince William County. Uh, of course, a little flashback. Uh, the history of the area certainly goes back uh, uh, before, uh, before the post-war period, uh, and um, of course before 1770 as well. Um, but I just thought I would, I would make a quick reference here to the fact that the old Thoroughfare Gap name is mentioned in the Great Treaty of 1722, aka the Treaty of Albany, that was established between the leaders of the Five Nation of the Iroquois and Governor Alexander Spotswood of Virginia on behalf of his colony, wherein the boundary line between the Iroquois and the English frontier was negotiated. So it's not a single piece of paper, it's actually a series of, of, of uh, uh, communications back and forth as they kind of um, discuss where, where the line is and where, supposedly, the, uh, the English colonists will, uh, will, will hold back. Um, and one of the earliest resources uh, that we know that's built in the area is Chapman Mill, 
um, initially constructed in the mid-19th century on a track that Jonathan Chapman patented in 1742. The mill is referenced when the county line between Fakir and Prince William is created um, and appears here on the 1770 map, although in the wrong location. Nah. Uh, anyway, evidently it's, it's requested that Mr. Chapman wanted to, uh, to build it back in Fakir, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it ended up in the Prince William County side. Um, another early map from the area, this is the 1820 John Wood map, which I'm sure many are familiar with, um, and it certainly shows us how important mills were on the landscape at that time. Um, and the face over here in the corner belongs to Edward Hill Carter. Uh, he was born in 1767 and died in 1806, the son of Charles Hill Carter and Mary Walker. He came to Prince William County, we know, before 1797, and he died while overseeing the construction of the mill with the little uh, arrow pointing there uh, in 1806, leaving behind a widow and several very young children. Um, I have highlighted the mountain uh, uh, road there coming out of Haymarket, but you can see um, what is a pretty sparse, um, I guess, wagon travel uh, uh, overland route, overland routes through the area. But the Carter family, um, as I'm sure the name is familiar um, to most of us, they had vast holdings. And I joke with some of my fellow researchers that it's really hard, it's really hard to, to dig up um, uh, good details on rich people. <laughs> um, actually, people when they own land at this level across, I know the, the Carters have um, land in Fairfax, in Loudoun County. Uh, they've got their colonial air plantations down at Shirley, at, um, at, at Nominee Hall. Um, it becomes a challenge in a way because the paperwork is filed in so many different localities and you may be missing one thing in this place that you can track down in another. Um, so again, the, the technology and the people who are putting things online, um, I actually uh, uh, had discovered there is um, an enslaved uh, uh, database that uh, Nominee Hall has been working on to help illuminate um, some of the connections there, but, but they really do um, extend um, across a wide array and a wide area. And tracking down the details can be time consuming. Um, but after uh, Edward Carter dies in 1806, his wife later dies in 1815, and uh, they start, they as in the Virginia Assembly, starts passing acts um, to relieve his minor children. Uh, and provide for the division of his estate. And what you're seeing here is an 1818 plant uh, that was recorded, uh, actually I found, in a Prince William Chancery cause case uh, dating from 1883. So you never know where you find these little nuggets. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this plant was prepared at the direction of Messrs. Love, Stith, Washington, and Buckner. Uh, when the track was surveyed, a part in William County and part in Fauquier County, agreeable to a patent granted by the proprietor of the Northern Neck to Charles and John Carter, dated 1724 and containing 5,720 acres. Um, and in this division, uh, Edward Carter gets Cloverland, which you can see. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for my um, inconsistent use of color. I hope it all stands out well. Some things are pink, some things are orange and yellow. But hopefully we get a sense here of the landscape. What I will say, what I enjoy most about plats, they kind of feel like, like a little... Um, like a little bite of chocolate uh, uh, for the researcher, so to speak, because one of the most fixed things on the landscape is actually property boundaries. So if you have not discovered that yet, I highly encourage you to play with Google Earth um, and, and make image overlays that you can easily kind of see how these things relate. Um, so, uh, so a little bit of the, of the waterway there has changed, but here are the essential divisions um, of this 5,720 acre tract. Edward Carter got Cloverland, including the Washington Lease Land, which is the area dashed um, there in, also in pink, along with 22 enslaved laborers, livestock, and plantation utensils. Car uh, Cassius Carter got 736 acres on the Haymarket Mountain Road and the Thoroughfare Mill Road. So that um, tells you the, the names that they were using as those two roads split. Um, include, that would have included Belted Field, it's later called Belted Field, and Stith's Lease Land, at that point now owned by Griffith Stith and occupied by William Tyler, along with 29 enslaved people, livestock and plantation utensils. Charles Shirley Carter uh, got what was later called Saint Hill, Saints Hill, it's 1,320 acres, along with 25 enslaved people, stock and plantation utensils. Um, and John Hill Carter got 2,039 acres, while Mary Carter 
Mary Walker Carter, uh, the only daughter, got 25, uh, 275 acres, part of Cloverland, and another 200 acre tract in Culpeper. So I think she was a little gypped there. Um, but, uh, but anyhow, so unfortunately, uh, um, well, fortunately for some perhaps, um, in October 1821, Edward Carter dies, uh, unmarried and without issue. He leaves his Cloverland tract to his brother, Charles Shirley, including its stock and enslaved laborers, and the Washington lease land to his brother Cassius was all of the same. It required both brothers to pay their sister Mary Walker $1,000 from these farms. How nice. Um, and just a few months later, uh, Cassius dies unmarried and without issue. And he, lives, he leaves his land in Prince William above the town of Haymarket to his brother Edward, uh, but luckily there's a codicil that corrects that, changing it now to be devised to the firstborn son of John H. Carter, and he asks that that son receive his name. He also gave the plantation farm called Tecumseh to Charles Shirley, so now Charles Shirley is acquiring quite a bit of land, um, and to the poor people within five miles of my premise, the proceeds of the mill, or 100 barrels of corn, the option, that Charles may choose for 10 years after this period, the mill becomes Charles's. So there was just kind of a moment of how that played out. And Charles Shirley Carter um, makes a couple of mortgages and starts to seem to be running into some trouble. Uh, uh, this advertisement here from 1834 is where he's trying to sell 1,200 acres, that is, uh, Cloverland, along with the house, barn, and other improvements, and a sawmill. He notes that Mr. Edward excuse me, Edmund Newman is the farm manager there, and you can make appointments to go see uh, him to speak about it. Um, but yeah, so Cloverland was just one of four different plantations that he had owned, uh, uh, but he is not, he's not residing there. He's, it, it, he's mostly in Richmond, from what I can tell, and that's actually where he dies in 1840. But before that, uh, he has a conveyance with uh, Mary Walker Carter, now Delaney, who is married uh, Bladen T. Delaney, uh, and by 1838 tax records, it seems Bladen Delaney is paying the taxes on Cloverland. Um, in 1856, Bladen really, uh, reports having 2,200 acres at his disposal, so that's quite a bit of farm. Um, and just a moment to talk about um, the enslaved uh, uh, laborers and other hands uh, required to farm such a tract, <laughs> if I may. Edward Carter's will noted 57 enslaved people. And from that division where I was allocating and talking about who got what, uh, Charles Shirley inherited 25 from his father, but another 51 from both of his brothers. And in the 1830 census, uh, Charles Shirley reports having 26 enslaved people in Prince William County, while his manager, Mr. Newman, has six enslaved laborers. Um, again, I think that's hardly enough to run uh, uh, the amount of, of acreage that he had. So undoubtedly, he's either renting uh, uh, labor or um, leasing out portions of his farm or hiring out um, other, other laborers to tend to, to, that, to that acreage. Um, John Hill Carter in 1830 reports having 50 enslaved laborers on what would have been his more than 2,000 acre Falkland estate. Um, and Bladen Delaney is identified with 35 enslaved laborers in Fauquier County at that time in 1830. There is a noticeable drop between all of them and what they're reporting between 1830 and 1840, and again, even into 1850. So, um, so it's unclear exactly, uh, because again, they, they still have these large farms, and we know, uh, we, we know things are going on, so that's another future research question that I will, uh, that I will leave out there for everyone. Um, but of course, when Bladen Delaney dies in 1856, um, uh, many of his workers and his property um, actually falls to the responsibility of his sons, um, Bladen and Cassius, uh, uh, Bladen Jr. and Cassius Delaney. Um, but he also left a widow and young children, so those things require um, extra special care. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as, uh, as I roll in through the early makings of Thoroughfare Community at a place called Carter Switch. Um, I'm highlighting here the vicinity of it, um, and uh, um, of course it's not noted as a station or a stop at that time, and implying a switch doesn't seem that it's really got, um, got a lot of gravitas, um, but it's certainly um, notable, and, and John Hill Carter, I actually, in, 
in the times that you correct your research and you realize you did something wrong, John, John Hill Carter is actually um, the same as John Hill Jr., I believe. I'm getting confused in the records going different ways, but he's actually chairman of the Manassas Gap Railroad. It's very important to him, so it's absolutely no surprise that he put a large stretch of it right through his property and then, of course, made, made the attempt to um, load or switch so that he could load his, um, his items onto it. Uh, and the work starts on building this railroad in 1851. It required a lot of labor. Early railroad construction was also not safe. <laughs> and, um, and we know that uh, the railroad companies uh, often used enslaved gangs that were hired um, to do the cut and fill work, the hard and tedious work. Um, but Carter Switch uh, actually uh, becomes the home of the Thoroughfare Gap Post Office in 1854. Um, and in 1856, uh, it's renamed from Carter Switch to Thoroughfare Post Office with Tyler serving as the Postal Service. Now over here at the side I have an 1860 uh, land tax map produced by Safer. If Mr. Safer is in the room, thank you. Um, anyhow, uh, you can see where I highlighted uh, uh, the trail of, of the railroad and also um, I just wanted to point out the square that's right below Cassius Bladen and John Hill that says Goldsboro. Uh, that is 304 acres that John Hill Carter sold to Nicholas Goldsboro he was a field engineer for the railroad and also the husband of, uh, of his daughter, of John Hill Carter's daughter, Lavinia. So he got 304 acres right there on the switch. Um, oops, did I even go past this one really fast? Uh, I, just quickly uh, to point out um, the other side of the road, uh, Cassius Carter, the one who inherited from the firstborn son of John, uh, of John Hill from his uncles, uh, gets what is called... Um, Washington Lease Land, but actually is referred to as the Walnut Farm in local tax records in 1865. And also um, uh, we have the, the belted field property here that in 1859, at the age of 24, he is anxious to sell. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that was more than that's 11,000 uh, or 1,137 acres that he had divided into three farms that he was attempting to sell even before the conflict. Um, and here we go with the Civil War. <laughs> a big deal, for sure. Um, the Manassas Gap Railroad being the first one to, uh, to transport soldiers, Confederate soldiers, into battle. Um, also, um, being uh, uh, evidently thoroughfare, Gap was a very large meat packing facility as well um, that was bringing in uh, uh, livestock from around the area as they were preparing uh, uh, meat for uh, as a large scale basis for an entire army. Um, Bladen and Cassius Delaney, they joined the Confederacy uh, after the first battle in July of 1861, at which time, uh, after which, in November of 1861, they've sent substitutes. Um, so they, they would rather be home on the farm, whereas Cassius Carter, anxious to sell all of his property anyway, um, has enlisted in the 4th Virginia Cavalry, the Black Horse Cavalry, in September of 1861, and he doesn't come back. I don't think he wants to be a farmer. Um, but anyway, uh, 1862 also holds events. I mean, I like actually the top map because in a way the, the, the bleeding of all the ink um, uh, is a bit of a metaphor for how much the, the, the war just coated the area and, and how it was something that, um, um, that clearly uh, uh, stay, stayed with us. And of course, between November 1st to November 7th in 1862, we have the Union Army Corp camping uh, in the area, the German troops led by General, uh, General Adolf, Major General Adolf von Steinhuer, that were camped at Carter Switch um, before and after the burning of the town of Haymarket. Um, we also have great um, primary resources uh, from members of the Thomas family, um, which if you've read uh, the PIF or, or know more about the area, um, William, Joseph, and Richard Thomas are the sons of William Thomas. They are freeborn uh, African Americans, and they uh, made a claim with the Southern Claims Commission following the conflict, um, talking about uh, the farm that they have in Prince William County. And at this point, they identify it as being situated near Thoroughfare. So we know that, that name's clearly being used here. Um, and they had rented 195 acres. So in addition to whatever they owned, and that, uh, they did own some property, they were also renting and producing crops um, it, during the 1862 conflict. Um, and they asked during this, during this claims uh, report if, if Mr. Thomas, if he's definitely for the union, you, know, you have to prove your loyalty. And, and I think it's telling. He says all the colored people were for the North, but scarcely any of the whites. 
we were all threatened with being hung or sent off south if we showed the Yankees any farms, and we had to be very cautious. Um, he also points to several uh, local African Americans, also mostly freeborn, who can testify in support of his claims in this process, Eli Thomas, Eli Hall, Charles Murray, and Hampton Cole, um, who we know to have lived um, uh, in the vicinity. Um, Another point of view comes from Samuel A. Marsteller. Uh, he is writing a letter to his son in 1864, A. A. Marsteller. Uh, he is also with the Virginia, 4th Virginia Cavalry, along with Cassius Carter. He provides family news and he comments on the Union troops occupying the area and on Union spies, including one armed, armed African American who reported on John S. Mosby's movements. So we know it is a tense time and. Um, and, it, and it's affecting everyone's lives um, in, in dramatic ways. Uh, and as much as the war destroys, it also unifies. Um, over here at the left, the Underground Railway Map, um, courtesy, thank you, from the Afro-American uh, Historical Association of Fakir, um, shows a lot of the pathways in and around um, that people of color uh, uh, would have been using um, to move throughout the area, and I think it's a um, it's a great resource to point out again, spatially, how, how, how fluid and back and forth these, um, these communities uh, really were and, and had to be, of course. Um, another way that, uh, that people came together because of the war, particularly people of color, was through service in the army. And we actually know that a number of thoroughfare descendants and area residents were members of the uh, US uh, colored troops particularly Regiment 23, I am learning. Um, this was actually a regiment that was largely formed um, at Camp Casey in Arlington. Uh, I found a great report that says that it can't quite identify which one. There are multiple camps at which these people, often formerly enslaved, are fleeing towards um, the district. But we know that Porterfields over on the far right is one of those, um, and of course, uh, in, in going through different names that I knew were common in the area, there was also William Fletcher, who indicates that he was um, uh, born in Prince William County. And I found another one for Alexander Johnson. And I, uh, it's hard to be certain, uh, um, but, but I think there's a good likelihood um, that Alexander Johnson is also a former member um, of the USCT. Uh, the USCT, or at least the 23rd Regiment, spends a lot of time at Camp Casey, and they're doing a lot of um, basic drills and other things, that, uh, um, digging trenches and these kind of things, but they're not being sent into battle for quite some time. It's not until um, actually at Petersburg, uh, uh, 1864, that, that the Union Army decides to put them uh, into service and into battle, and even then, USCT leaders had to fight for equal compensation. Um, and it was, um, but it was quite a unifying thing, and, um, and of course it gave them extra freedom and autonomy that they did not previously have. Ooh, I forgot to point out the last thing just down here at the bottom. I kind of snuck it in there, and I should have done a little line. Um, this is a clip from um, an 1867 voter, voter roll, which um, uh, is so wonderfully made available. The Library of Virginia has a great project called uh, Virginia Untold. And if you have not quite gone there, um, you can Google this and you can type in something as simple uh, as a first name. Uh, uh, but, but it is a great wealth, and there have been a lot of people at work um, to transcribe the resources on there. And from that work, I was able to identify in the 8th District, um, which is Fauquier, Rappahannock uh, County, that uh, we have um, a, a Francis Fletcher. I don't know if that's um, quite related to, to William up there or, or to Frank Fletcher that we know. But we also have Solomon, um, Eli Elijah, and Alexandria Johnson down here. So we know that he, Alexander Johnson, is in the area um, at that time. Post-war, other, other opportunities, um, death and lawsuits is what I had to say here. Um, Cassius Carter uh, Delaney, Cassius Carter Delaney, it's easy to mix them up, um, dies in 1869, unmarried without issue, um, but he leaves a will, and um, his father's will had set him and his brother uh, Bladen Jr. up um, with quite a financial burden to hit their stepmother and to their, to their younger siblings. So this results in a lot of lawsuits, including one between their stepmother and, and Cassius' estate. And this is where we get um, this survey here. This is in 1870, 1870 or 1871. There are two that are actually done here, dividing Cloverland. 
Um, and over at the right, you'll see an advertisement for sale for the sale of John Chapman's mills here as well. As he devised, his estate is divided in the post-war period. Um, but of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, loss of laborers, um, death of young men during the battle, um, and also the systematic changes that are affecting area agriculture, the dissolution of plantation landscapes, and the rise of sharecropping and tenant farming. This presents opportunities for some of it, for people like Thomas Primus. Um, Thomas was actually known by the name of John um, in the 1870 population <coughs> census, and Cassius Delaney's will provided uh, or, or uh, stipulated that, that he be sold 20 acres of land uh, to, to do with and, and preserve his family. Um, now, this gave him some autonomy, but I think it's very interesting to note this is the 18. 70 census, which again lists him as John, although we know he changes his name to Thomas um, shortly afterwards, and then the 1870 agricultural census, um, a snip up at the top, and the order is very similar, so you can see that they, they followed their process here. But John there is listed with 45 acres, so we know he's doing more um, than just the 20 acres that he was allocated. And it takes, even though Cassius Delaney dies in 1869, it takes until 1873 before the deed to Mr. Primus is finalized. So we know he's working the property and that he's there. And of course, that little excerpt from the plat showed where his acreage was. Um, Dovetail survey identified and recorded. I mean, they're, they're known, but we certainly recorded and gave numbers to the sites associated with the Primus family that remain. Um, that includes the Primus family cemetery, uh, the, there is a Primus house not pictured here. Uh, that's a little bit later. The site of the North Polk School, which is the older image down here at the bottom. Uh, the Johnson Primus house, which is here in the middle. And you can see there are some shared, a little bit of shared similarity construction between these two. And the site of the Lewis Primus store, among others. Um, much of the land that was sold to the Primus family remains in the family today. Uh, the North Polk School is a great legacy to the family as we can see here that uh, Mrs. Toller, who Evelyn uh, uh, Primus Toller was one of several teachers in that family um, that worked at the school that operated from 1885 to 1936. And local uh, African-American carpenter, a freeborn man uh, from Rappahannock County, Frank Fletcher is credited with helping to build the building there. So we'll move on to some other early African-American property owners that also uh, um, came out with land as a result of Cassius Delaney's uh, uh, death in the division of Cloverland Estate. In the 1870 census, which is what the excerpt down here at the bottom is, we see Alexander Johnson, who I had mentioned uh, as a possible USCT and also certainly a voter in Fauquier County. He's listed as a cobbler along with a Moses Morrison, who is a stone fencer at that time. They're both listed in Fauquier County's Scott District, but we know that's just a stone's throw away. Later census records, of course, record them just as farm laborers, but Johnson, uh, we know, has also, uh, was also a church leader and a pastor. He helped establish the Little Zion Church in its original location, which, uh, according to the 1901 map, you can see where I've circled church, and it also appears in one of the early um, training maps here, 1898. Uh, you can actually see the boundary of the road, as I mentioned earlier, the deeds and the land parcel boundaries. Um, uh, that, that helped mark these spaces. But the, the plat up here at the top from 1879 is actually from um, Anderson Davis Smith, or A.D. Smith, who sells both to Moses Morrison and Alexander Johnson, or Johnson uh, these two lots, lot one and two right there with their little houses built on. And in that deed in 1879, he notes that they are both occupying the land, which he is selling them already. So we know that they've been there um, for a time. And Moses Morrison is actually uh, reports living on Walnut Farm, which again I mentioned is what Cassius Carter is calling the Washington Lease Land for a time when his son Wesley is born in 1874. So we know that they've been there uh, uh, in this area, and clearly we still have the boundaries and the parcels um, that show that occupation. And so some sites that we identified associated with Morrison and Johnson's family uh, include this Simmons and Johnson Cemetery, um, the Simmons House, which actually you can see being moved here in 1866 down at the bottom, uh, the site of the New Zion Church in 1882, the predecessor of what becomes Oakram Baptist. And, um, and Oakram Baptist Church is also affiliated with the family because they're the, the, um, the, the legacy uh, of the ministry stays with, uh, with uh, of the Johnson family. Uh, uh, for sure. All right. 
And now moving back a little bit, we talked about, um, I talked about Cassius Carter wanting to sell, very anxious to sell in 1859, but he actually doesn't get to sell it uh, until later, until 1869. Uh, but it goes to... Uh, Farms, um, uh, another division is actually sold to uh, Robert F. Mason. Actually, that Mason's. Was a in the uh, enlisted in the Confederacy? Anyway, Nicholas Goldsboro again, being a field engineer, um, and I believe that um, I believe that Mason was working, uh, but we definitely see him. Uh, by 1873, being, being in local papers and, and noted as a traveling and corresponding agent for the railroad. He acres, the kind of L that goes over here um, to the Manassas. Uh, or acreage that John more than 500 acres to the railroad. I believe it's being used. And of course, then they're also trying to develop it and sell small Virginia farms um, that are just so excellent with wonderful credit terms for anyone who wants to come down from the north and give us your money, right? <laughs> All right. But, but, but Mason either seems to know that there's trouble ahead or, or he just comes to the end of his, his rope. Um, between 1872 and 1873, he mortgages um, that property from Goldsboro, and it eventually is seized and resold to Dr. Thomas C. Smith um, in 1875. And Thomas Smith actually lives in D.C., um, but he makes another series of notable divisions around the thoroughfare station. Um, and I have pointed out here, Mr. Hefner is in the room. Thank you so very much. Again, the, local, the shoulders that we stand on um, uh, he, he shared with me his research, and, and it was very helpful because the deed courses in some of these early descriptions are, um, are, are uh, a little out of whack, but it all started to, to make sense. Um, so here's just um, a, a little clip of the series. You can see over here, um, William Yateman gets the, station, uh, gets the building where the station buildings are on the depot lot. Um, actually, at the very bottom, that small little um, rectangle, that is where we know. Uh, the thoroughfare deeper was at that time. Um, I have also put an asterisk around known carpenters and builders. So when I had said earlier in the thoroughfare's historical significance statement, noting that it's a time of rebuilding, um, uh, is it's pretty it's pretty unique and pretty amazing that we have so many people with carpentry experience that are coming to this community and no doubt working together in other places around uh, the area as well. Um, of course. Uh, uh, Frank Fletcher and J.E. Payton, that is actually John Edward and sometimes J.E.A. Payton, John Edward and Andrew, whoo, I'll get there. Anyway, um, uh, they are definitely um, uh, both, both known carpenters and get to work. Actually, um, uh, I should go back just for a minute. Uh, uh, Mr. Payton appears in a, in a Prince William Birth County Register for a son, and he's actually labeled as a mechanic as early as 1881. And there is a, a lien, a mechanic's lien, that's placed on the property he owns, a wheelwright and blacksmith shop and house um, uh, in, near Thoroughfare Station. So on this three-acre lot here, where I said that there's been a house um, as early as 1881 for the tax records, I believe that is also where his wheelwright shop um, was located. Um, it's hard to say because, of course, he did also buy land over here in connection with George Gibson uh, that, they, that they sold and redeveloped as well. All right, but, uh, but discussing a little bit more on these um, early carpenters and uh, African-American and people with Native history here. Um, these are some, some of the highlights. There's John Edward Andrew Payton, and of course he has 
He marries two of Frank Fletcher's daughters. Um, previously, his wife, Susan Thomas, is also related to the Thomas family, the, um, the, the freeborn uh, people who have farms around Waterfall. Um, and then we have, um, I, I listed George Gibson, uh, the man who he joins to, um, to develop the land with, along with his consort, Fanny Morgan. They, they do not marry, um, but we know quite a bit from a chancery case related to George Gibson. He died in test eight at Thoroughfare on February 8th in 1890 at the age of 65, having never married. His parents were deceased, and just three of his 10 siblings survived, uh, or per, survived to produce living heirs at that time, um, many of which were living in New York City, uh, Washington, D.C., um, and elsewhere. Anne Washington, his living sister, was a patent in the case as they went to deal with his estate. Um, and the court determined that his property was um, indivisible for the number of heirs that they had identified, so it goes to public auction. And it's divided into three lots, two of which are purchased by Mrs. J.W. Fletcher, um, that's Annie Fletcher, and she actually resells uh, this acreage back to Millie Morgan, the daughter of Fanny Morgan. So we know um, that there's some good connectivity um, uh, between the area's occupants and their support for one another. Um, in a situation like that where there was no legal, legal ties, that they were still working together and, and that Miss Morgan's children uh, benefited from that. So um, the Native American ties that we identified through oral history come from the Pamunkey tribe, Rappahannock, and the Cherokee that are associated with these people. I mentioned um, Frank Fletcher being born in Rappahannock County. Kate uh, uh, Voss, or also Kate Bland, uh, was actually born in Warren County. Cornelius Allen is in Essex County and travels this way before he marries one of Frank Fletcher's wives. So there is certainly, um, again, the idea that people are coming to Thoroughfare, that it is a safe haven, that these are these connections that are supporting um, the community's development at that time um, is really makes lasting impacts. And some of the sites that are associated with um, those individuals and beyond this area east of what was the Thoroughfare Station, we certainly have uh, Fletcher Allen Cemetery, there's a Potter Cemetery, the Scott Cemetery, the site of the Allen House, the site of the Fletcher House, and still standing the Mount Berry House. Um, there is an image as well as sites like something as simple as a well. Um, these, these artifacts, these um, tangible items are still there to reflect the area's occupation. Um, even when some of the other sites have been lost. And that includes other early African-American residents. Uh, there was acreage that belonged in a house to Mima Gib Grigsby. Uh, Mr. Payton, as I mentioned, had had his blacksmith shop as well as Jack Wallace. So sometimes even though we can't see it, the history is still there. Um, this is a little bit about the, it, ha, it begins in 1886 that Kaiser is also getting involved in the subdivision of the properties around Thoroughfare. And so this is the northern uh, edge of town, what comes from the Cassius Carter's belted field uh, property. And here again, just a few um, call outs of the properties that I was able to identify through our research. Um, and, and thank you to Prince William County for the historical deed viewer online. Um, that's one of my favorite things, uh, connecting the tracing, the dots through deed research is um, illuminating. But as I said, uh, Charles Eugene Kaiser had moved here and occupied the farm since his father purchased the property and his son, Charles H. Kaiser, sticks around as well. Um, they, the belted field in this little angle of it here, of course, and then Washington, the Washington Leasland over at the side. Washington Leasland is actually where the military training grounds are around the turn of the century, um, where we see a lot of those great maps coming out. And that area is also where uh, Charles Kaiser in 1922 makes an oil and mineral lease with the Pamunkey Oil Development Company. Um, still, the depression is not good to the Kaisers, and, um, and by 1930s, um, uh, they... Uh, at least they are, they are mortgaging and out of a lot of their property. But, but all, of these, um, all of these individuals that I've highlighted here, these are all African Americans that, um, that Kaiser is selling off um, these lots to. And so some of the sites that we've identified along, uh, along Thoroughfare Road at that edge, uh, the Isabel and Howard Washington House, Oak Room Baptist Church, probable burial sites at Oak Room Baptist Church, the site of James Mitchell's house, the site of the Odd Fellows Hall, and again, other resources that potentially remain, uh, the um, homesteads of Harriet Coleman, uh, Bertha Primus Robinson, and some of the others that we pointed out, or that I pointed out there in that call out. And that kind of pushes a little bit more into our 20th century history at Thurver, of which there is quite a depth, and 
the preliminary information form. I like that it's called preliminary because I feel like there's, there's still so much uh, uh, to uncover and build upon, um, particularly uh, when, when you're dealing with um, you know, under-resourced communities. Um, and what I like to say is you know, uh, uh, groups of people that, that political, social, and economic forces have really conspired to, to diminish. Um, and so it, it, makes it, it makes it more challenging, um, but, but I, again, am very heartened by the number of resources and the ways that technology is helping us learn more and, and scour a broader, uh, you know, a broader landscape for these resources. So some of the 20th century history, and I say mid 20th century, but it should be the first half 20th century history, because of course I have the North Fork School up there again that operates 1885 to 1936. Um, and brings uh, many African-American children and, and people of color to thoroughfare uh, on a regular basis. It is replaced by the Antioch McRae Elementary School, of course, um, when that opened in 1936, uh, built just south of thoroughfare. So it's no surprise that that, um, that, that is in close proximity. Um, another resource, of course, um, is always the church uh, in tight-knit communities. The Oak Room Baptist Church acted as the social and spiritual center for thoroughfare community, providing a safe gathering space for members not only to worship, but also to hold community functions. From the original, as origins in Alexander Johnson's house as the Little Zion Church, to the construction of the existing building in 1909, Oak Room Baptist Church continues to house community activities besides religious worship and education, including community meetings, um, like those held during the 50s and 60s when many area residents volunteered with Prince William County's chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And this is, I found some great resources. Um, the DC Library has some access to some wonderful uh, uh, newspaper collections. And so anyway, I, I had wished um, that uh, some of the other people have to send. I just found Miss Beatrice Washington's picture there. Um, but, but the local chapter at Oak Room Baptist was very involved in, in the network and in the, um, in the Northern Virginia uh, uh, NAACP. And, and I know the Fields children uh, talked about the uh, trips that they made to Washington, D.C. Uh, to, to advocate um, uh, for, for civil rights during, um, during that period and also to attend uh, Martin, Luther Dream, uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So um, very, very tight-knit community and also very involved in the world around them. Uh, another great uh, resource from the first half of the 20th century is the Oddfellows Hall that is no longer standing, but it was at the, first, at the corner of Thoroughfare Road and um, Route 55. So the, uh, let me see here. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to round it back. Here I am uh, 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 coming up because, of course, we're only supposed to, uh, uh, for, for the purposes of the National Register, you only go to the last 50 years. We've decided that historians need this space in order to decide what's really important, you know. Um, so we often stop at the mid-20th century, but, of course, um, the history and the connections go, go way beyond that. And as I said, the, the church was a part of a greater, broader community um, network. Uh, Oak Room's leaders and congregation maintain strong uh, um, community associations with Olive Branch Church, uh, Oak Shade Baptist Church, First Baptist Church at Manassas, and the Northern Virginia Baptist Association, along with the Baptist Church at the Plains, and Pilgrim's Rest. Um, and in um, the ways that additional research is coming to light and the ways that we are really working to, um, or more information is out there, um, about African-American rural communities. I just briefly found um, Loudoun County has a great report about, uh, about its African-American communities. And of course, Fakir is working on it at the same time as Prince William here is. So these little pins I've dropped in places that actually have names, surnames associated with some of the same original and early founders of Thoroughfare. And as you can see, going all the way up into Loudoun with Willis and St. Louis, when I had just Googled um, Delaney and, and Carter, uh, en enslaved, and I had actually discovered that those communities were founded by, um, by uh, formerly enslaved um, people from, from the Delaney's and the Carter families. So anyway, it brings back to mind that African-American uh, or Afro-American Historical Society map, again, the Underground Railroad map, and how much the travel north uh, um, along various roadways along the mountains um, and, and these connections between these disputes um, in the lives uh, of, of its residents. So. The historical significance of thoroughfare embodies the establishment of a safe haven community for former slaves, freed people, and native peoples in the postbellum period and reflects the growth and development in its continued occupation by the descendants of the community throughout the Jim Crow era and into the mid 20th century. The dispersed pattern of settlement is seen as a spatial expression of freedom. 
that also created new crossroad communities and small towns that emerged as a foci of the stores to furnish merchants who served black and white farmers on farms and plantations, as well as two other modest expressions of black freedom, churches and schools, in the third quarter of the 19th century and into the 20th. Thoroughfare's history and continued occupation by generations of direct descendants of the lots of original owners during the period of Reconstruction on land divided from larger plantations is, a cult is culturally significant under criteria A for the National Register for its association with important local events, particularly those associated with the establishment and development of the village of Thoroughfare. It also illustrated new patterns of this dispersed settlement that were visible in the post postbellum period in the region. It's also significant for its association with social, important social and ethnic trends led by its African American and mixed race citizens, which resulted in greater autonomy for its residents and supported the socioeconomic growth of this and other Prince William County communities of color into the 20th century. Like other resource challenged communities, a lot of thoroughfares history that is no longer visible at the surface, but the archeological potential remains. So we believe that the area is also significant under criteria D, the large number of both extant and no longer extant resources with strong associations between them offers potential insight into the late 19th century and early 20th century African American and Native American life ways, burial practices, settlement patterns, consumption practices, and similar researches research questions that archaeologists use to tell more about our past. But like I said, um, history is not, is not ever over, even though we have a, 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 a bit of a cutoff um, for the purposes of, of, of preservation um, in, in the government's role. Um, thoroughfare's history continues, as many of you know, into the um, late 20th century. And here's just a few um, kind of things that I think um, reflect that. In the mid-20th century, of course, we recently lost, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Willie Fields, um, but his contributions to help provide better opportunities for African Americans in, in the area, driving them back and forth as a shuttle surface to, to other places, uh, you know, Fort Meade, um, around the Pentagon, up to D.C. Um, of course, Betty, and many people will remember Aunt Betty, as everybody liked to call her, um, being a local keeper of, of, of knowledge there in that community, a storyteller. Um, and the 1990s, of course, the effort to stop Disney and prevent a colossal uh, uh, theme park um, uh, will certainly go down as important things that members of the thoroughfare community have done, um, as well as the collection and compiling of um, African American history in the area. Um, and I look forward to learning more about the community and the history of Prince William County's diverse landscape and all the ways it brings people together, just like we see here today so that we might enrich our own lives and connect in the present because of the past. Thank you.